Hi, Kathy here. In our last video, we looked at some of the changes that were starting to happen in Italian art in the 14th century, some ideas that were stirring that promised a new approach to art that would result in the flowering of the Renaissance. This week, we finally arrived at that point, the 1400s, aka the 15th century, or as art historians like to call it, the Quattrocento. Again, a shortened form of the Italian Mille Quattrocento, or 1400s. We'll be looking at some work that should strike you as contrasting strongly with Gothic art and architecture, except before we do, it's important to note that even in the relatively small region of Europe, the Renaissance didn't happen all at once. Gothic architecture in particular was a very compelling style. In England especially, a highly refined version of the Gothic style, perpendicular Gothic, continued to develop right into the 16th century. While the High Renaissance was going on in Italy, King's College Chapel in Cambridge is a great example of this well-named perpendicular style, really emphasizing an exaggerated soaring height. We said the Gothic period was an age of faith. We looked at a lot of cathedrals in that lecture, and certainly Christianity did not come to a screeching halt in Europe when the Renaissance began. A lot of what we'll look at today is still going to be church architecture and depictions of Bible stories and Catholic saints. We'll see a lot of Madonnas, but we will start to see some changes there too in attitudes towards religion and art's role in expressing religious faith and who pays for even religious art. What I'd like you to watch out for in today's images is the spirit of rebirth. And we're really talking about the rebirth of classical or Greek Roman ideals. How did 15th century Europeans know about classical ideals? Well, thanks to the church, Latin continued to be the language of scholars throughout the Middle Ages. Even though it wasn't spoken as a vernacular language, many scholars delighted in studying the Latin texts of antiquity, Cicero, Virgil, and even older Greek texts that had been translated into Latin in antiquity, Homer, Plato. The scholars who studied them began in a rather dramatic shift to be infected, if you will, by their pre-Christian ideas, whereas in the Gothic period, the Greeks and Romans were more or less pitied as being born too soon to be Christians. Now scholars began to revere their accomplishments and to emulate the ancients' spirit of inquiry into science, mathematics, and the natural world. These scholars were called humanists because they emphasized the potential and agency of individual human beings rather than their sinfulness and dependence on God. At first, though, it was just a question of emphasis. Humanism and Christianity were not seen as mutually exclusive. Dante, for example, wrote his Divine Comedy, A Soul's Journey Through Hell, the Inferno, Purgatory, which is sort of a halfway station between hell and heaven, the Purgatorio, and heaven, the Paradiso. His long three-book-length poem lays out and elaborates on basic Christian dogma. But Dante's companion and guide throughout the journey to the Christian paradise is Virgil, the pre-Christian Latin author he admired above all others. Dante, despite being such a great Latinist, chose to write his divine comedy, not in Latin, but in the Tuscan dialect of Italian that was spoken in his native Florence. Others followed his precedent, establishing by the time of the Renaissance the first body of vernacular literature, accessible at least when read aloud to anyone, not just a tiny group of scholars. Dante is a medieval figure. Remember, we saw in the last lecture that he put Enrico Scrovegna's father in hell for usury in his Inferno, but he was one of the late medieval humanist scholars who started this process by pointing to Greece and Rome. This is Giotto's portrait of Dante. They were contemporaries. It's apparently extensively restored, but it was painted during Dante's lifetime when they were both in Florence, so very likely from life, since we know that's how Giotto liked to work. We saw how in Giotto's painting in the last lecture, that desire to study nature and work from life was definitely a sign of the rebirth of classical ideas because the Greeks studied nature. In Northern Europe, that fascination with the natural world really began to take off with a sudden interest in landscape. Remember we said that whereas landscape painting in the East 
China, Japan had been an established art form for centuries. In the West, it was not considered a worthy subject for painting until now. We saw how illuminated prayer books had been popular during the Middle Ages among nobility who could afford to commission them. By the early 1400s, the painters of Northern Europe were really seeing these as an opportunity to show off their skill and rendering of reality. The three Limburg brothers, Paul, Hermann, and Jean Limburg would have been a reference to their home region. This was commonly used in the 15th century rather than a surname, a last name. The Limburg brothers were probably the most famous team of illustrators in the Netherlands. These tiny, detailed gems of landscape painting appear as calendar pages in their Très Riche Ur, the very sumptuous book of hours of the Duke of Berry, created in 1413 to 16. February shows farm laborers warming themselves before a fire, beehives, lots of detail here. Fencing, you feel like you could make a fence by this method, it's so carefully rendered. A thicket of wood being chopped for fuel, wonderful landscape detail. Tiny town in the distance. The calendar page for August shows us a group of nobility with their falcons soaring around them. And this would have been quite typical to, to alternate between showing the peasants working and the nobles having a good time, I suppose. November, my own favorite, shows us a swineherd in front of a wonderful landscape, a sea view here through forest trees with a castle thrown in for good measure. In all of these, but November in particular, I think, we see the first signs of atmospheric perspective that we've seen so far in Western painting. Remember how good at it the Chinese were by this time? You still don't see it farther south in Italy for a while, but this Northern European fascination with observing landscape from nature quickly yielded a realization that colors, contrast, and edges get softer as they do back here in the ocean and mountain in the distance. Details get less vivid as you look back into deep space. Let's take a look at sculpture, too. This marvelous piece in Dijon, France, by Klaus Sluter, from the very early years of the 15th century, the turn of the century, really, was originally only the base of a much more elaborate sculptural group, portraying a large freestanding crucifixion with figures of the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, the Apostle John, the very ungothic freestanding figures that were originally above this base were destroyed during the French Revolution. But these supporting sculptures that remain show how far Sluter had come from the Gothic tradition towards the new spirit of naturalism. The Old Testament figures surrounding the Well of Moses, while not freestanding, are pretty close to it, and they are portrayed as distinct individuals with distinct psychologies. Their drapery, in particular, is very ungothic, with its swirling volumes giving the figures mass and energy. And while we're in Northern Europe, let's take a look at panel painting. Painters in the Netherlands and what's now Belgium, Flemish, we call them after the province of Flanders, love to paint on movable wooden panels, as opposed to the common practice of painting on walls that we've been seeing in Italy. Even paintings for churches were generally painted on wood panels rather than directly on the walls. The Northern European painters also had developed the use of oil paint, which allowed for much greater detail than the tempera used in fresco. So we'll see some of these Flemish painters really glorying in that. For example, in this work by Robert Campan, the Merod altarpiece, for all its amazing detail, it's quite small, about four feet wide when it's open like this. The wings on either side would have folded up to cover the central panel. The middle panel shows the Annunciation, the moment when the angel tells Mary that she will be the mother of Christ. Campan's ability to create all that fine detail is put to use by filling the painting chock full of hidden symbols, readily understood by his contemporaries. The white towel hanging on the wall symbolizes Mary's purity. The hanging water pot, look at its tiny, precise reflections and its shadow on the wall. That symbolizes her role as the vessel for Christ's coming into the world. Her husband, Joseph, is shown over here in his carpentry shop on the right panel, and the donor 
and his wife kneel and observe the scene over here on the left through a door. Although there is no consistent vanishing point yet, the spaces are legible and ambitiously deep, much deeper than anything you'd have seen in Gothic art. And in each panel, there's at least some beautiful reference to nature, a garden, a view outside the window. Even in Mary's room, the tiny section of sky is so beautifully painted darker at the top and lighter towards the horizon as the sky appears in life. Let's move on to someone you should recognize. Remember Jan Van Eck. Here's his Madonna of Chancellor Roland again. You looked at this with innocent eyes a couple of weeks ago. Let's look at it now in the light of what you've been learning and see if it looks any different to you. First of all, the subject. Before you were speculating, now I'll tell you that the man on the left is Mr. Roland, the donor, who commissioned this painting from Van Eck to hang in his parish church in Autun, France. The church later burned down, but the painting was rescued. One good reason to paint on panels rather than walls, I'd say. The space itself, very elaborate and convincing, though still not quite using a consistent perspective system. The figures, for example, are a little too large for the space. So if Chancellor Rollins stood up, He'd find himself unexpectedly close to those arches, and he'd have to bend down a bit to squeeze through them. Speaking of the size of the figures, did you notice that he and Mary are about the same size? This was true of the donors in that altarpiece that we just looked at as well. That's a new idea, right? Compared to the Gothic practice we were still seeing in those medieval and Trecento paintings we looked at last week. Maybe humanism expressing itself visually giving humans a greater pride of place relative to the divine figures. And what about these arches? Do you recognize them as Roman arches? Even the arches of the bridge out there in the landscape, Roman rather than Gothic. Interesting, right? Another expression of that idea of rebirth that we're looking for, going back to the ideals of ancient Rome as opposed to the upstart Gothic architecture. I want to show you this landscape up close because several of you had questions about these two tiny figures. There was some speculation that they might be children. And I had to agree that their heads seem disproportionately large and therefore childlike. I discovered that they are adults, however, adults wearing the super large headgear of the day, a turban-like hat called a chaperon, really a combination of hat and cape. The figure in the red chaperone on the right here may even be Van Eck's self-portrait. When you zoom in, I believe, maybe you'll agree that they really do look like adults, just with very large hats. You'll notice that the landscape painting here takes the atmospheric perspective of the Limburg brothers and pushes it even farther with quite a haze over the farthest parts of the landscape. Look at these beautiful mountains, way, way in the back, miles away. There's incredible detail in this observed space. The elaborate cathedral on the right, see that? The reflections in the water. So we have a thoroughly modern painting here, showing the birth of the Renaissance in Northern Europe with its humanist approach to the figure, a real portrait of a strong-minded individual. We'd recognize him on the street, right? Especially with that haircut. The figure equivalent in size to Mary, shown in a believable space, with close observation of nature. Out of all this, though, I think the thing most people take away from Van Eck is his incredible skill, mostly manifested in the way he rejoices in detail. Look at this close-up of the pillars in the background. He actually rendered these so carefully that scholars can tell exactly what Bible stories were being represented here. The expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise is this one. Cain's murder of Abel. Noah's drunkenness. Even more impressive to me is the effect of light and shadow on this patterned robe of the chancellors. I mentioned that one of the reasons Van Eck could achieve these effects is his use of oil paint. It takes longer to dry than the tempera that was used in Italy at the time, days as opposed to hours, so there was much more working time. And oil, because it can be used transparently, allows for layering. Van Eck perfected a system of underpainting and glazes. He typically would render his whole painting in grisaille, grayscale, remember, 
getting the drawing, the lightnesses, the lights and shadows the way he wanted them, and then add the color in a second stage, going over his underpainting with layers of transparent glazes. Van Eck's Ghent Altarpiece is one of his most famous works. It's his earliest known work that still exists. In fact, it is thought the work may have been begun by Jan's older brother and finished by Jan himself. And what a testament to his skill. This is what the painting looks like when the altarpiece is open. You can see that it's hinged, just like that marode altarpiece that we look like, only this one is more complex, of course. It would only have been opened one day a year on Easter to give you an idea of the treasure-like quality of this brilliantly complex painting inside of it. The basically symmetrical composition seats God, Mary, and John the Baptist at the top with angel musicians flanking them and Adam and Eve, of course, on the sides. And below is an illustration of the communion of the saints based on the Bible's description of Jesus as a sacrificial lamb. You can see the lamb there in the center of this landscape being worshiped by crowds of believers. Incredible detail in the landscape and the portrait-like studies of each individual figure. Let's look at the Adam and Eve figures. See the little grisaille paintings above their heads? More Bible stories. We get the killing of Abel again. But what I'd like you to notice is the way the figures of Adam and Eve are very much like the grisailles. The little grisaille paintings have been left in grayscale to suggest that they are sculptures. If you imagine Adam and Eve in grayscale, and then Van Eck painting over them with warm brown glazes, very transparent, you can perhaps get a feeling for the way he would progress from an underpainting to the final rendering. The figures who happen to be wearing clothing, of course, would get more brilliant coloring, but by the same technique. Here's the altarpiece closed. And you can see that Van Eck kept some of these figures in grayscale, again, to suggest that they are sculptures. If you compare the donors here to these trompe l'oeil sculptures in between them, this technique of painting something so carefully that the viewer might be at least for a moment tricked into thinking it's the real thing is called trompe l'oeil or fool the eye. The donors, a wealthy merchant and his wife to continue our Renaissance theme of even ecclesiastical church art being commissioned by secular patrons, they are pictured in the corners. Before we leave the Ghent altarpiece, I'll just mention that it was so popular and beloved that there's a story about the Duke of Burgundy visiting Ghent in 1458. The townspeople, wishing to honor him, greeted him by arranging themselves in small groups, then standing frozen like human statues, like we might see today at street fairs. They were all dressed in costumes, recreating the exact scenes from the Ghent altarpiece, their town's biggest claim to fame sort of a quattrocento flash mob. I like knowing that this piece, which is high art to us, was popular culture to the people of the 15th century. Finally, we can't leave Venek without a look at the Arnolfini double portrait. This has commonly been regarded as a betrothal painting, marriage being generally confirmed with a contract rather than a religious ceremony in the pragmatic 15th century. Recently, an art historian suggested that instead, the picture with its strong feeling of testament from the raised right hand of Mr. Arnolfini may have been a record of his power of attorney, showing that his wife was authorized to act for him while he traveled for business. This illustrates the difficulty of being sure that we interpret the symbolism of another century accurately. But most scholars agree that this painting is packed with symbols, even if we're not quite sure what they all meant to 15th century viewers. The fruit under the window is generally thought to symbolize fertility. The small dog may symbolize loyalty. The convex mirror on the wall may symbolize the all-seeing eye of God. But it definitely has two figures depicted in it. Besides the backs of the Arnolfinis, which you'd expect to see, let's zoom in. There are the uh, backs of the figures in the portrait. 
But in between here, there are two figures reflected as if they are in the position of the viewer. And one of them wears that same red turban that we saw in one of the small background figures in the Chancellor Roland painting, remember? Which is why art historians believe that figure may be the painter himself with the red turban being a sort of trademark. Can't prove that, but it's fun to think of. He signed the piece here, Johannes de Eck, Fuit Hick, 1434. Jan van Eck was here, 1434. And let's zoom back in here to enjoy the tiny scenes from the life of Christ that were painted around the mirror and the shadows and the reflected light from the beads hanging on the wall. Incredible detail, what a guy. One more painter from the Northern European Renaissance before we head south, Rogier van der Weyden. Little is known about his life. Scholars have pieced together what's known of his career from contemporary documents. This painting, the deposition, is known to have been commissioned from van der Weyden by a guild, a crossbow guild. Again, we see the movement of money and power from the nobility and the church to the guilds. Sometime before 1443, which is when the first copy of it was done by another artist. Here we really see the Renaissance interest in the human individual. Look at the faces. The artist makes the reality of death very clear, not just through the tones of the flesh, but through the paleness of the fainting Mary, grief of Christ's stricken friends. Christ and Mary are shown as utter humans among humans, strikingly more so even than in Van Eck's work. Van der Weyden's beautiful portrait of a lady combines the same interest in the individual human likeness with an instinct for idealization, which would have been familiar to the ancient Greeks. This secular portrait, and we'll start to see lots of these now with the Renaissance, combines a feeling of extreme particularity with a vision of the woman as an idealized beauty, one that she would have been flattered by, I imagine, but not so over-the-top flattered that she couldn't immediately recognize herself, looking her best. This modest portrait has a stunning composition. The abstract shape of the transparent headgear, I love the way it just kisses the side of the rectangle on the left as the hands do on the bottom. The flame-like red of the belt warming the canvas and calling out to the one other patch of warmth, these full lips. Just an exquisite composition, reserved but so quietly full of humanity. One of the great paintings. According to Marilyn Stockstad's art history, I'm quoting, more names of artists were recorded during the 15th century than in the entire span from the beginning of the common era to the year 1400. This to me is one of the great effects of humanism. Not only were artists becoming more interested in painting portraits, and in painting individual human beings in a similar scale and a continuous pictorial space with Christ and Mary and other divine figures, they were also becoming very interested in being known as individuals themselves. We saw Van Eck signing his painting, for example, quite centrally and even flamboyantly, the Arnolfini double portrait. And this is the point where you're really going to notice that there will be a lot of names of artists in your glossary for each lecture. Because as artists began to think of themselves, and as their patrons began to think of them as uniquely gifted, creative individuals, fine artists as opposed to artisans, their names began to matter to affect the price of artwork, for example, and thus to be recorded 